1983, interview with Mrs. Pearl Maids, and this is Joe Todd. Mrs. Maids, when were you born? I was born in 1908, March 20th, 1908. And where were you born? I was born at Mango. Mango. Now, my uh, parents lived at uh, Granite, and uh, my brother was, two brothers were born there. And, of course, they were there at the time of statehood. And uh, uh, they had a rough time out there. Back then, you know, the southwest Oklahoma was poor, pretty poor. They didn't have uh, mm -hmm. all the good water that they have now. Mm -hmm. Who was your father? His name was uh, William Elsia, E-L-S-E-A. And where was he from? He was from Hannibal, I believe what it is, Missouri. Somewhere up there. I'm not real sure where he was born. Yeah. Okay. And who was your mother? My mother was Elizabeth Steimer. S-T-E-I-M-E-R. And uh, she was born in, at, in Cincinnati. But uh, they were both living in St. Louis when they met and married. Went out to the great country, a great, yeah, was a country then, mm -hmm. <laughs> from Oklahoma. How come they came to Oklahoma? Well, at that time, it was just like the gold rush, you know, or they thought it was a land of opportunity. Mm -hmm. But most of the real good farming land was already. When did they come to Oklahoma? I'm not sure. It must have been uh, in about 1906. Mm -hmm. They went through the depress Depression in 1907. Did they tell you about that depression? Oh, yes. What did they tell you about that? Well, you know, they... They didn't think it was bad. I mean, they were hardy people. They had already uh, managed to get along on little or nothing, you know, just coming out and starting in. They, uh, they lived in a half dugout house. My brother was born in that. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they didn't think the depression, Great Depression in the 1930s, I mean, they'd been through it like how we had. We're not. So what? Mm -hmm. This is a depression? This, this is not a depression. <laughs> this is silly. We don't feel that way mm -hmm. because we learn to to manage and to make do. Did they tell you what caused the depression of 1907? No, I don't believe so. Mm -hmm. And of course, back there, you know, we didn't have the news. We knew little or nothing. Did they close the banks? I don't know. The amazing thing about the bank closing, when it closed in 1930, when all the banks in the whole country, this uh, little town where we were in this development, right next to it, was the bank. The Bank of Franklin, Arkansas. It was the only bank in the United States that was not closed for the reason that they did not get the notice to close. <laughs> there was no telephone. So they, 
So the bank in Franklin was the only bank that didn't close? In the whole United States. Hmm. But there was no telegram and no, uh, oh, of course, wireless or anything. No telephone. So they just stayed open for business. Uh-huh. They never closed. Of course, they reopened, you know, what, what two days was it? What was it? A couple of days or so. How'd your parents come to Oklahoma? Well, I don't really know. I think they probably kind of, they married. I think they just kind of ran away and got married. My dad had a promoter type and, and uh, he just thought it was a place of opportunity, mm -hmm. I'm sure. And uh, he could talk to my mother into anything. Anything he said was, that was right. They come by train, you think, or? Oh, I I think so. So far, probably, I really don't know. What's your first memories of Mangum? Well, it was a pretty thriving little town, I think, uh, for that area. about it. I lived there until I was in, through the first grade. And then we, we went into, we went to Colorado. Can you just My dad was going to go into coal mining, make a million dollars. He's always going to make a million dollars. Can you describe what Mango looked like? Well, it was, uh, to me, it was a big city because it had schools and streets and lots of, to me, a lot of people. I think one of my memorable things was my dad bought the first automobile they had ever seen. And everybody in the whole town was excited about it. And he was going to show it up off on a certain time when it came in. And of course they expected it to come and he'd drive it off. But it came unassembled. And he was not a mechanic. But with the help of other people he put this thing together. And we lived at the top of a hill and it was a straight road, a street, and it was dirt straight down to the main building, downhill all the way. So he was at, we were at the top of the hill and there were lots and lots of people down to see, called him Will, Will Elsie with his automobile. And some way he had forgotten to figure out to use, how to use the brakes. So you can imagine what happened. Started out and just went, went. You couldn't stop the thing. And it ended up down on the main street and ran into something. But the whole town, of course, was, that was really great excitement for everybody. What year was that? Well, that must have ran in about, uh, let's see, it was about five. About 19, what, 11? Oh. Year 5, about 1913? Uh, yeah, 1912. About, about 5, 1913. Hmm. You say you went through the first grade in Mango? Uh, what school did you go to? I have no idea. I don't know that it even had a name. Mm -hmm. It was just one school. And your teacher's name? No. I'm not too. And a person to remember all those things. They don't stay in yeah. Then you moved to Colorado. What part? Trenchera. That's right, right by Trinidad, right there. And then 
dad went into coal mining, about which he knew nothing either. <laughs> but uh, doing real well until World War One came along, and then of course everything was bad. That was a depression, and the government took over the. So your father actually had a coal mine in Colorado? Uh -huh. But the uh, government took over the coal mines. So he had no job, no money. And uh, mother had never worked. And uh, we really had it hard. That was what you call depression. And the way we survived brothers and I, we picked up coal along the tracks for coal to heat for heat in the winter. And my dad uh, had a job with a wholesale grocery place. And uh, he took all the discarded fresh vegetables side of lettuce and all that. And we ate that. And for one week, we lived on oatmeal, nothing else. But oatmeal. No, no sugar, no milk, nothing. So I can't eat it to this day. That was during World War I? How come the government took over the coal mines? I don't know unless they needed the coal for something in connection with the, uh, the war. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. Did your father go to the war? No, he didn't. Mm -hmm. That, uh, why, I did not know. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether he was too old or, I don't, or they didn't take them. Was there too much, much huh? uh, was there any work for the war effort around Trinidad and Trinchera? Oh, no, I don't think so. I don't know any. It wasn't centrally located enough to, to use, I guess, unless it was just a coal mine. How big was Trench Europe? Oh, it's a little town. It, it probably, I started to say like uh, Edmond, but Edmond, that's so big now. I would say oh, not over a uh, thousand people. It's still small. Is. How far from Trinidad? Now, Trinidad is, is a bigger town, close to the corner of the state. But uh, Trinchera was just a little town. Was coal mining the main industry in Trinchera? Uh -huh. well, coal mines right outside there. What did your family do after World War I? Well, they moved to Oklahoma City. What year? That would have been in uh, 18, oh, when was the uh, uh, armistice? 1918. 1918. Because we were had just gotten to Oklahoma City when the armistice. What was the armistice day like in Oklahoma City? Oh, it was uh, just exciting. Everything. Everybody was cheering and the parades and the bands were playing. And it was a happy, happy time. Because the country was sad shape right now. Mm -hmm. And they had just gone through the 1907 Depression. I mean, uh, the United States. It looks like there's depression ever so often years. Mm -hmm. um, what part of Oklahoma City did you move in? It was in this, uh, down on Marino in Oklahoma City. Did you all go downtown for the armistice celebrations? Oh yes, everybody did. Mm -hmm. It was an exciting time. 
especially for the children. They, of course, didn't really realize what was going on, but it was exciting. How big was a parade? Oh, I think it was pretty big because they had oh lots of wagons and horses. And everybody turned out. Whatever bands they had in those days, well, they tuned them up, tuned them. How come your family moved back to Oklahoma, to Oklahoma City? Well, they moved back to Oklahoma because we were starving to death up there in Colorado. And uh, my brother had been ill, very ill, with inflammatory rheumatism. And uh, my dad had a brother, Frank Alcia, who lived at Mango, and another brother, Claude Alcia. And uh, they sent him money, he sent us money to get back. And uh, we all went to work. My Did you go to work also? I didn't work until I was uh, about 15. But uh, when I was in high school. But my brothers went to work right away as direct, direct delivery boys. And uh, we all worked. We all turned our money into to the folk. Where'd your father work? He worked for a transfer company. Furniture moving. What was the name of it? Oklahoma. Oklahoma Transfer Company. What did he do for? What there? Yeah. This is a delivery. Out delivery. On the track. Just moving. Anything he could get. Anything that it'd make. Where'd you go to high school in Oklahoma City? I went to Central High School in Oklahoma City. What year did you graduate? Graduated there. What year did you graduate? I have no idea. <laughs> That's crazy. I don't know when I graduated. I probably have it somewhere, but... <laughs> mm -hmm. Then well, you went to work. Work. Huh? Then you say you went to work? Uh -huh. Where'd you go to work? I worked in an uh, insurance company. They had an AET and I had an insurance. I worked at? after schools. Yeah. And uh, then when I graduated from high school, uh, they gave me a full time job. And I, I've never, I never had any college. What did you do for? Just typist, policy writer. Where were they located? Uh, they were located. Concord building it was their first office. Uh, or the, oh wait, no it wasn't, it was the American National Bank building. That was where, it, which is now the first national building. First national bank in America. It was, uh, yeah, they, they, they were in that building. I didn't go, I couldn't see any point in going to college when I had a job. Yeah. Anybody who had work, you know, was making anything. In this is the 1920s. Right. Were you a flapper? Oh, yes, definitely. Well, what is a flapper? Well, it was uh, a fad, of course. It doesn't last. But uh, it was mostly the style and, of course, the dance. It was always the dance. And uh, uh, the one thing that, that uh, designated the flapper was her hair. They cut it. Every 
everybody's hair up at that time was, was long, you know, and put up black braids or whatever. But we shingled them. And they were cut up the back and had little spit curls. And I mean, that was completely different from what they'd had all their lives. You could tell a flapper her hair, her lack of it. What kind of, what kind of dress did you wear? They were short, they were about, uh, they were straight, completely straight, no waistline at all. And uh, they came to about two inches above the knee. And high heels. And uh, if you uh, had some lace, uh, black lace holes, you had it. And we thought we were really cute. What kind of dance did you do? The Charleston was the most popular one. Everybody had to do the Charleston. So if you had short hair and high heels and a short dress and did the Charleston, you were uh -huh. in. Oh, okay. yeah. How long did that last, the flappers? Oh, it lasted, I, I would think, five years at least. Because, and of course the Charleston, it's done now with, with the modern dancing. You know, I mean, not really, every, oh, not the kids. Kids don't dance nowadays. That's true. Clear across from each other, you know, I mean, dance, you're not dancing with anybody, you just dance, get out there and jiggle. <laughs> Where does the word flapper come from? I have no idea. I never did know. We might look that up and see. Yeah. I never thought about it, I never thought about asking. What kind of car did you drive in the 20s? Oh, Model T was the first. That was a Model, model, model T that my dad put together. And Model A, mm -hmm. Ford. And of course, we then we got real fancy and got them with a rumble seat. Now that was something. Rumble seat. That's a seat in the back. Uh huh. And that what they call a mother-in-law seat? Oh yeah. Mother-in-law could sit there and see what was going on in the front. The only difference in the rumble seat, instead of a, tr a trunk lifted up from the back, you see, this lifted up from the hood. Uh, yeah, not from the hood, but from the front seat, back, and made a seat. But who cared <laughs> if you were necking? You're necking then. That's right. yeah. mm -hmm. Then 1929 came along. Oh, yeah. Stock market crash. Good old 19. It just seems like about every 20, many years, not 25. Well, it begins about every 20 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See if you figure 29, uh, in the 40s, see, we had a depression, you might say, well, it didn't amount to that much, and go on up another 20 years. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Where'd you meet your husband? Where? Where and when? I met him in Oklahoma City. Where? I don't know exactly where. He was a, introduced to me by a friend who wanted to get us together. I guess you'd call it a blind date. And uh, but where? I, I don't know. I 
probably, uh, probably was a dance. We went to got a Spring Lake Park. The big band there, right? this is great. Oh, that's when you really dance. When did you get married? Uh, we married 1940, and we married on Sadie Hawkins Day. You know what Sadie Hawkins oh, Day yeah. is? We had Sadie Hawkins when I was in school. And uh, didn't realize that it was Sadie Hawkins Day. Yeah, we had set the, the uh, date. I said, well, I wouldn't marry him if it was on St. Yacht. He would never let me forget that I'd caught him on St. Yacht's day. But uh, we married late, late in life. To regress just a little bit. Huh? I'd like to regress just a little bit. And what was your first impression of Oklahoma City, 1918? I guess probably that we were, it was such a big city to us because we had not known any big cities at all. And when you come into anything as large as Oklahoma City, it seemed like New York City, I guess. Mm -hmm. What were the major buildings in 1918? Well, I think there was the American National Building and the Concord, uh, Concord Building. Uh, was there, or just a few years later, probably. And uh, everything was inside the Huckins. Yeah, the Huckins. Oh, yeah, the Huckins was the hotel. The hotel. And uh, we thought it was very grand. We thought if we could just go into the lobby and look around, it was. What did the lobby look like inside the heavens? Well, it was real ornate. It was, it was beautiful, really. And it kept that way long, long years. It, it was. Even later on, like in 1940s. Still was kind of elegant where you went there to to dine, you know, or dining rooms. It, it was really a lovely place, mm -hmm. and it's it stayed that way until it was not too many years ago, I guess. How did the depression affect you of nineteen? Well, it was really rough because that was the time that, uh, of course, we didn't, we weren't in soup lines for sure, but uh, it was really rough. I happened to be the only person in the family, including my mother, father, one brother who was still in or even, he was married. None of them had jobs. Except you kept your job at Edna. I kept my job. What was your salary, what was your salary in the Depression? I think I got probably around uh, $60 a month. Mm -hmm. Did that see the whole family through? Oh, yeah. You made it through. What kind of meals did you fix in the Depression? I don't know how in the world she did it, but we ate. What'd you eat? I think I can't remember. It wasn't uh, probably beans, potatoes, things that would fill you up, biscuits, anything that you can make uh, gravy with, have biscuits and gravy. And uh, it was. Uh, 
we never seem to mind it. Because we, en we enjoy eating together and being a family. We never had very much of anything, but uh, we always had a lot of fun and love. And uh, my dad, of course, was a character. And uh, uh, he was a, one of these fun Irish, Irish and great sense of humor. My mother was a tiny little thing, a little French lady, mm -hmm. and she was treated like a little doll. And we all took care of mother, especially dad. He treated her like a little princess always. But she did her part, I mean. And uh, she stretched what we had to eat. people gravitated to, to our place. Mm -hmm. Dick Trova. Oh, wow. And if we can get a new record uh, with a little money left from grocery money, we lived up on Placent Boulevard. City, which was the avenue to take a drive. And we had a two story house up there, and all the young people stopped at our place. When did you move from Reno to Classic? Huh? When did you move from Reno to Classic? Oh, dear. teens, I know, because we were all dancing. People would drive by, even uh, people, my uh, folks, uh, ages, and they'd see the lights on or cars, cars parked by, they'd stop. And the first thing you know, the place was alive. You roll up the rugs, and everybody dance. With a Victrola. Mm -hmm. a Victrola. What block of classes was the house? 29. 29. 28th class, right on the corner. It was 2901, I think. 2905. That's so changed now with all the big business buildings. It's commercial. But uh, my dad was loved people, and he took in everybody who was part of. And we never knew. We had a lot of rooms upstairs, boys, young young men who were down and out or didn't have a, a job at the time. Lived there. And mother, mother never knew whether she would feed the family of five or 15. She just cooked plenty and everybody was welcome. Mm -hmm. It was just a wonderful life for me. I mean, mm -hmm. I can't look back and think about how mm -hmm. things were bad. Mean? They never seemed bad. Yeah. Where were all the big soup lines in Oklahoma City? The what? 
Where were the big soup lines in Oklahoma City? The big what? Soup lines? What part of town were they in? Well, they were down on Reno, but they weren't out oh. west. Out the west street, they were more downtown. And uh, we never knew too much about them, I guess. They were there. But at that time, of course, you, you have your radio, it's just starting. But you don't hear all that news or see like we do. We hear all the bad things. Mm -hmm. We're saturated, saturated. Mm -hmm. Very, very depressing. Did uh, your father or any of your brothers work for WPA? No. How about they never CC? For the or CCC, either one? Never. And you married in 1940. What was your husband's name? His name was Lewis, L-O-U-I-S. Mades, M-A-D-E-S. What kind of work did he do? He was with the bank. When I met him, he was with the federal uh, bank. And uh, then he went with the Liberty National. He was with the Federal Reserve, and he was just a mail boy. And when we married, 1940, uh, we uh, we didn't make very much money. Both of us too. December, but nothing ever seen for it. December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor Day. Yes. What were you doing? Well, I don't remember exactly when I heard the news, but we had just gotten married, and uh, Lou uh, had already been what do you call it when you register for the draft? You know, they were all re already registered. Mm -hmm. He was one A because he was unmarried and right age, and uh, or in the age group he was young, he was in his thirties. But uh, we married, and in January we. January, he received his orders to report to Fort Sale. January of 41? Mm -hmm. And he went right away. And he went to Fort Sale and then went to Texas for training and went overseas and stayed two and a half years. He was in all of the Italian invasions. What oh, unit was he in? He was in a, an anti anti aircraft battalion, but I don't remember the name, the number. And uh, he served his time, and he was gone for two and a half years. But before he left in December. After we married, we bought a, a home up on Northwest 48th Street, mm -hmm. 500 block, brand new little house. And uh, instead of having most most of the women, you know, had to go back to their parents to live, and it was rough. But I didn't. I could. By that time, I had what was considered a good paying job. You still with that? Uh, no, uh, I was for part of that time. And then I had gone to Ledbetter Insurance Company agency. And uh, I was with them. 
and uh, I had, I guess, always been a good employee because I learned insurance all phases. And I had a good job, I was considered a very good job with Ledbetter. And uh, I was guess so good <laughs> or valuable, I don't know what I what I have to you call it. And when Lou was down at Palacious, Texas in training, he was getting ready to go overseas and he wanted me to come down and stay about a week and see him for him. And I went for a week and stayed for four and a half months <laughs> before he was shipped out. And I had told Mr. Ledbetter, when I found I wasn't coming back, that uh, just to get someone else, not to try to have the other girls absorb my work while I'm there. And he kept telling me that he was not going to let my job was there, open for me any time. So he got in extra help or whatever he did. And so I had the job to go back to. Oh, that's good. So did you work for Med Better all during the war? Uh -huh. And so that way I had the job and could make the payments on her at home. Did you do any work for the war effort? Oh, the only thing I did was the Red Cross Motor Corps. It was the only war deal I did. And what's that? What's the Red Cross Motor Corps? Well, it was the Red Cross had this motor corps, and what we did principally was we, when we were on duty, we, uh, we met all the trains and would greet the soldiers that were going from place to place or their family meeting them there and helping them in any way we could. And also we could take them from train station to train to catch another train mm -hmm. or even the airport. And uh, there were lots of things that you could do there were, people, there were soldiers who had come in who had been wounded and uh, of course we could help them in any way we could and get them where they needed to go. And uh, it was just to, just to help to, that way. And then of course in, in case of uh, a disaster of any kind, we were called out in on duty. As a, for instance, in southwest Oklahoma City, we had a tornado that swept through a section there and just cleaned it. There wasn't even a blade of grass left, nothing. And I was called out and I was on duty for more than 24 hours. And what I was doing was trying, everybody, relatives were coming in to find what had happened to, to these people. And of course, Red Cross had set up uh, centers in, in schools where they could rest and, and have food and, and shelter. First aid. <laughs> I was always scared of that. I'd have to use mine. <laughs> but fortunately, I didn't. What didn't was um, VJ Day in Oklahoma City like when the war ended? Well, 
for me, it, it was, can't explain how, how it felt. It was just something that was just unbelievable nearly, you know, because at long last, after three and a half years, he hadn't even heard his voice. Be like at last, he would be sent home. And uh, so I started looking for him. He had never even got, at, at that time, you know, the men overseas had gotten home, you know, about once a year for a leave. But he, he never got away. They never let him go home. And uh, so he was a, a staff sergeant and uh, personnel, and he handled all the personnel. And his commanding officer said he, was, he couldn't let it go. He was too valuable. And he kind of acted as chaplain. He was over and all these young kids, and they called him Pop. There's always one guy, you know, that oh, yeah. he was here. Right. But uh, to me, I was just, oh, it was just unbelievable that long last thing was over. Did you, were there big celebrations here in Oklahoma City? I don't remember. I, I imagine that there was, but I wasn't concerned with it. Mm -hmm. I think one reason was that it seemed like almost instantly the war ended. Then they were dismissing more soldiers from the training places. Anyway, I was busier than ever at the Red Cross, and I did all this work uh, after hours. I still had my job. And of course, that was just volunteer work. Voluntary work. I was just having more to do. They needed more, there was more to, uh, you know, people going back and forth, soldiers and their families. And uh, uh, But just the, what was the worst thing to me, uh, I think of the whole, the whole war to me was the time a VD day. I thought it that, and I say my husband was his outfit it was anti aircraft in, in Italy, northern Italy at the time, uh, and wasn't in active combat right then. He had been in the invasion, two of them. And uh, then on up took Italy, we run on up to, that they would send his outfit home, and he thought he would be. And so they sent all of these soldiers that they were going to send home to these uh, disembarkment places to catch the ships on. And the thing that I have never forgiven truckers for the ship, ship shipyard. Mm -hmm. They went on strike. And there were there were no ships to bring them home. And that was when I really let down. Up to then you have this this hope, this pair of this courage, bravery, whatever you want to call it, can keep you going. And he did not And that was the longest time. Well, it was it was just forever. Of course, he was having this hard time over there. And they sent thousands, thousands of men to these places. There was they didn't even have enough food to feed them because they expected to ship them off. But I've never had any use for unions since. 
That was just simply unbelievable, unpatriotic. It was un-everything to me. But of course, I finally made it. <laughs> that, that was the longest time we, of the whole war for me. In the late 40s and 50s, what did you and your husband do? Well, he started back with the federal, of course, Back then, with the war, you know, all the companies tried to take their thing back. You know, gone to war, and uh, but he did. He decided he didn't want to go back to the banking bit. Why? I don't, I don't remember why he did. So he went into business with uh, my brother, who was in the cleaning business out. Midwest City, and uh, that didn't work out at all. <laughs> that wasn't for you. And so then he, they were all restless. They didn't know what they wanted to do. And then he decided he would be a salesman. And he got a job with a calendar. Traveled out to Oklahoma, state of Oklahoma, mm -hmm. selling advertising. But he was gone all week. And he'd been gone so much that I didn't like that. <laughs> so he went down to the Liberty National Bank. He knew people down there and uh, went down and asked them. So he went there. And, uh, and he was there until uh, I don't remember exactly the year. It must have been about nineteen seventy two. Bank up here called him. They were neighbors. And they had been moving in from the old, old building they had down here. It's a, it's a rally. Mm -hmm. And uh, thinking about it anyway, planning on it. So they wanted a mature banker, they said, somebody that knew something, not these young kids coming out of school. So they asked me to go to work. Oh, it was just perfect then. So so that, that, that was with the Citizens Bank. Oh, Citizens Bank. Mm -hmm. And until uh, 1978. And then he retired. We went, uh, he retired early. I don't know he did. We went over to Arkansas. And we were over there years until he died of a heart attack. And I had become ill with one thing or another and have ever since. And then, so I moved back here to be with of course, my son. Now you have one son? Mm -hmm. How many grandkids do you have? Two little girls. Two little girls. Mm -hmm. My son is Mark Maids and uh, he uh, is a teacher and coach at junior high here. He went to school here and went to college here. Got both of his degrees. And uh, then he began teaching and coaching. And uh, he thinks Edmund is all the place in the world today. He's, He's been offered quite a few jobs as our pay, paying jobs as a coach, he has a real fine record. But he didn't want to leave Edmund. Yeah. Well, I'd like to regress one more time. Besides the incident with the car and Mangum, what's your favorite childhood memory? Well, it's silly. The 
one that I can remember. I was known as Pearl Elsie at home, friends, relatives. And when I went to the first grade, the first day, the teacher knew who I was, of course. But she asked everybody their name. And I spoke up and said, my name is Lillian Pearl Elsie. Please call me Lillian. And after I said that, I, I was embarrassed about it. I didn't just see myself being so persnickety. But anyway, my records in school, clear through high school, went as Lillian Elsie. And I was called Lillian at school and Pearl at home. And I, they thought I had a twin sister all oh, my life. All my records are there. And still, I get a small pension check from the Federal Reserve that was loose, and uh, it's to Lillian P. Mays. <laughs> so, still, I have two names. Mm -hmm. But I remember that. Uh, that's the only thing I really remember. What kind of games did you play as a child? Oh, we played Ring Around the Rosie and uh, Hide and Seek and uh, what's that other one? Anything like that. We, we played our own games. I think the best time I had in the way of games things was in Colorado. We lived right at the base of a mountain. To, our, to us it was a mountain. It was probably a hill. But uh, there was a long range, a train, a train that comes in from Trinidad and comes across this trestle, across this little river. Vast rocky little river. And uh, we were allowed to, every Saturday, to go hiking up there, take our lunch. I, I was a tomboy. And uh, so I could go to, so the three of us, my two brothers, uh, we went up there one Saturday and we were never allowed But that day we were a little late getting back home, so we decided we would go across there. And uh, my oldest brother, Mark, he was our leader. And so we started across there. Oh, yeah, and the train comes out of a tunnel, it goes across that trestle. Can't see it. And we got about halfway across when we heard the train. There's no sign things at all. And there wasn't much time. So, of course, I probably panicked, but I don't know what I did. But my brother Mark, he, he, he said, don't worry about it. We'll just get down underneath and hang there until the train goes over. And I don't know what the drop was. I don't know how many feet it was way down there and all these rocks and fast water. But anyway, we swung down there, hung down there, train went over. Well, that was fine, but I didn't have enough muscle to get, have, get myself back up on that. We had a terrible time. So the only way we could do it was my brother Mark told Frank to hold his feet. He went, leaned over, see, catch my hands, but he couldn't quite reach. And so he told me, he said, now when I say go, you reach up and grab my hand. <laughs> Can you imagine, kid? I didn't have any more sense than to do it. But he caught my hand. Mm -hmm. 
and then they pulled me up on. And we went across then, and after we got across, we sat down on the edge of uh, the bank there, away from the track. And uh, nobody said a word. <laughs> and my brother Mark spoke up and he said, We'd better not tell mother about this. <laughs> we didn't tell her until years later. We told her she could. Well, I think we have a good interview. Well, I've had fun. I have too. Remembering I things. I, I, I don't have the kind of memory that has all these dates up here. Mm -hmm. And of course, another thing that uh, has stymied me, I had a, a complete stroke since I've been here. The whole right side is paralyzed. And I could not talk or see or hear or walk. And uh, then uh, later on, I had a heart attack. I had a pacemaker. Mm -hmm. And uh, it affected my memory, part of the brain. My, my brain was stopped, they said, for about five minutes. Mm -hmm. And it was damaged the brain. Yeah. <laughs> I said, they brought damaged anything else, but my memory isn't that good. Mm -hmm. But I've come out of everything. I well, that's good. Walk and mm -hmm. talk. I took a lot of speech therapy. That's good. And, uh, well, I'm about out of tape here, so. Well, thank you.